Thank you. Um, good morning. Hope you're having a lovely day so far. And thank you for choosing to spend your weekend with us here at the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. A warm welcome also goes out to our digital pass holders watching via our live stream today. Now, just a very quick note, this session is also available in Arabic. So to access this via your smartphone, please scan the QR code outside the room if you have not done so already. So, بس السريع في ترجمة باللغة العربية للسشن ده فلو عايزين العربي please اطلعوا في QR code برا بس للسكان. So, um, today we're here to get happy, wholesome and healthy with two very special guests. One who has flown from the UK to be here and is no doubt enjoying the lovely weather and the other who is one of the UAE's popular homegrown talents. We're here, basically, to get creative with the classics. So, without further ado, please join me in offering a huge welcome to our guests. First up, it's Dr. Rupi Ajula, medical doctor, Sunday Times best-selling author, and the man behind the fantastic, The Doctor's Kitchen. Welcome, Dr. Rupi. And last but not least, our, our very own homegrown talent. Um, she's a cookbook author, presenter, and entrepreneur. It's Zahra Abdullah, also known by her brand, Cooking with Zahra. Well, hello, hello. Hello. How's it going? Hello. Very well. It's very early, I know, but <laughs> yeah. see, see who's turned up. It's great. So, we're here to talk about, obviously, your books, but at the same time, just a little bit more about you guys as well. So, first things first, you guys have... You guys share a lot of similarities, actually, even though you're on the same territories. But obviously, your heritage and upbringing, you know, Indian, Sudanese, Iranian, Arab, if we're including the UAE as well. So, I mean, the thing that we have in common is we all share a massive love for food. But you've also had your health challenges. Um, so coming to you first, Dr. Rupi, I believe this partly encouraged your journey with the doctor's kitchen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, a bit of background to me, I, I, I work in the NHS, I've worked as a doctor for about 12 years, um, and I got into eating a certain, in a certain way to improve my health when I had my own health issues, when I just qualified as a junior doctor. So I was 24 back in 2009, and I started suffering with something called atrial fibrillation, which is... Uh, a condition where your heart beats irregularly, and in my case, very, very fast. It was going up to about 200 beats per minute. And I went through all the different conventional uh, ways. I saw multiple different cardiologists. I had electrophysiology studies, had all the investigations, and I was going to have something called an ablation, which is where you put a guide wire into the heart and you burn an area around the pulmonary vein to stop these misfiring cells. Um, and I was 100% going to have this procedure, you know, newly qualified doctor, seeing a whole bunch of different senior practitioners all telling me to have this one procedure. But it was actually my mum, who's not a doctor, who said, you know, before you have this, you should really think about your diet and lifestyle. And I thought she was bonkers. I, I honestly didn't think anything of it. But really to appease her, I thought, okay, well, I'll try improving my diet bit by bit. Um, long story short, over about a year and a half, my AF episodes actually reverted completely. And I've been in remission for over 10 years now. Um, and so that was really the, the sort of start for me about how I could really see food in medicine and in the clinical context uh, and what I've started doing today and telling more people about it and looking into the research. Fantastic. You owe your mum a lot. I do you? owe my mum a lot, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> does she remind you? She always she, every now and then she does, yeah, every now and then. <laughs> Now, Zahra, um, in, your, in your, uh, your book, which is Cooking with Zahra, I love how heavy it is, by the way, it's this one. Um, you do also mention your own personal battle with cancer. Yes. You say, obviously, you're an advocate of wholesome eating. Um, how did your own health journey influence the way you cook and the way you eat? I think for me, um, I always say food is my therapy, it's my artistry, and it's my way of connecting with people. And during different stages of my life, one of those statements resonates with me more. And after having cancer, I had thyroid cancer, and I was always told, oh, you're very lucky, it's the easiest kind. So I kind of felt like a fraud, like I joined the Cancer Survivor Club, but I really didn't earn you know, the badges. Um, <laughs> I just had radiation, and that's it, and I was in isolation, and that was it. <laughs> so I never felt, but inside, I was not, I wasn't balanced. And so my way of balancing myself was getting into the kitchen. And I remember my sister and my husband were like, go cook. 
go cook and make us something. And I remember it was, some, it was a simple pasta dish I made with cream and mushrooms. And I thought, oh, I'm feeling good. This, you know, the whole idea of just chopping the onions and you know, sauteing the vegetables, that just settled me. And so I always say food has so much more to give back to us than we think or know it does. And it's not just about feeding us, but it does so much more at different times. I mean, that's so true because even the act of mindful eating, which you're both a fan, you know, fans of, it's, it's really important. I feel the pandemic has maybe encouraged a little bit more cooking for ourselves. Have they? Yeah. Have they not? Yeah, I, I would say so, definitely. I mean, uh, in the UK, uh, in London, everyone was cooking bread and getting into baking and that kind of thing. And whilst you might think, okay, it's not very healthy and I would have preferred if they knew how to make a, a green casserole with lots of different vegetables, I think that the whole point of uh, getting people into the kitchen is something to be celebrated so they can become more culinary confident. And that will eventually lead to them being able to experiment with different ingredients and, and diversity of food. And that is ultimately very healthy. So everyone starts their journey at different points. And I think it's really important to maintain sight of uh, the connection that we have with food, the cultural element, the fact that we can celebrate other people's cultures through shared meals. That is really medicinal in its sense as well. So. Yeah. We're going to go into the, the whole cultures thing now. Um, but obviously... You credit, um, oops, sorry, one sec. So, lots of books are carrying, that's yeah. why I had to put my notes down. So, you have a YouTube channel, yeah. podcast, brand new app, which was out in Jan. Yeah. How do you manage it all? And you have three books out. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I believe it was, this one was the first one, yeah, that followed was the first. by Eat to Beat Illness, and then 321, which oddly came out at a good time. Yeah, yeah, so that one speak. came out at the start, well, the start of last year. Um, uh, and I, during the promotions, I actually unfortunately got COVID as well, so I had to do everything remotely and not do any cooking. But yeah, no, that, that's probably um, my, uh, my favorite book, the three, two, one. Ah, yeah. uh, okay, because yeah. your three portions of fruit and veg serving two people using one pan. I love a one pan um, yeah. recipe, <laughs> um, it's gr great for me. So this is your favorite so far. Th that's my favorite, because that's probably the book that I use most, and, and I think I've had the, the best feedback to, because I realized like the first couple of books were really inviting people on this culinary journey through food as medicine, the science behind it, the exciting research, you know, what we can uh, do with beans and legumes and simple wholesome ingredients. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> three, two, one was really about putting that all together and making it uber practical for everyone. So you might think of like one pot dishes as just casseroles and stews, but you can make tray bakes, you can make stir fries. There's so many different types of foods that you can make uh, just using one pan and it minimizes the washing up. So for me, it was like winner. <laughs> yeah. Now I have to ask, what does your mother think of that? Because obviously growing up in a traditional household where there's a huge love of Indian cuisine. Yeah. So have you ever tried healthifying Indian cuisine and has it outraged your, uh, your parents? I'm lucky in that my, my mum comes from that sort of uh, Ayurvedic uh, uh, perspective. So everything that she puts on her plate, she's really thinking about the medicinal values and the combinations as well as the flavors. Um, but she's, she's not a fan of like just one pan because whenever I go there, I'm usually like the pot wash. I'm just washing up as she like makes a mess in the kitchen, which I don't mind. So you're the dishwasher in the Yeah, house. I'm the dishwasher See, in the No matter house, how yeah. old you get, it's always, always <laughs> the kids, always the kids doing the washing up. Um, so, so, I mean, do you, have you tried healthifying any Indian classics on your uh, own? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I like to do, like, healthier twists. Um, and I guess our session is about how much creative leeway we have um, with classics. And I think that there needs to be a balance, really, because I don't want to completely disrupt what is a dal makhani, uh, or a butter chicken um, without you know, being respectful of actually what the traditions are. But when I create food and create recipes, it's really a reflection of the patients that I see. So if I've got someone from a Somali background, a Korean background, a Sri Lankan background, I'm not gonna be recommending to them all to have a kale salad, that's not how it works. So I'll, I'll take their recipe, I'll ask them what they like to eat, and I'll say, well, can you 
increase this amount of veg? Can you add this? What about this ingredient? Um, and can you reduce this element of it? And that's really how I started creating recipes. It was a reflection of what people were generally eating and trying to very gently move them toward a direction that is a little bit more wholesome for them. And that is such an important point because it's, it's similar in a way to precision health where you're tailoring eating according to you know, gender, background, race. Because this thing, a lot of doctors, unfortunately, you, you go to and it's one size fits all. Even female versus male isn't taken into account even though we have very different hormones. Mm. So have you found it making a change like when you really tailor uh, an approach to someone, does that make a difference? Uh, absolutely. Like, I, I think um, if you just tap into human psychology, if you tell someone to do something uh, and it comes from an authoritarian stance, they're gonna, there's going to be some antagonism uh, to that recommendation, regardless of whether I'm telling someone to drink less, smoke, uh, cease smoking, or change their diet. So if you can bring them on that journey, and actually it comes from one of indulgence, and actually something that is appealing to them, and actually you know, something that they would enjoy, that's how you get behavior change, and that's how you get buy-in. And there are some simple motivational interviewing techniques that I try and uh, incorporate whenever I write recipes, or even talk uh, through recipes with people as well. So, you know, some of Zara's work, for example, uh, really reigniting people's passion for wholesome food. I want to try and bring elements of that into the way I talk about food because it doesn't all need to be clean, uber healthy, zero sugar, or those kind of swaps. It, it can be really, really enjoyable. Yeah. Now, Zahra, you, you, you're from all over the place. I mean, I know you describe yourself as a third culture kid living in Dubai. And your recipes are kind of a celebration of polarity, like you've described. How do you avoid not annoying the older generation of the family with your modern take on recipes? Because you've got a lot of people to please. I think it's, it's, it's all about perspective. It's not trying to... Um, undermine the integrity of the recipes, but maybe celebrate it and elevate it to another level. I mean, like recently, I've been sharing one of my childhood classic jams, and I got reminded of it when my grandmother visited me during the pandemic. Um, and what was really nice about that experience is that she took me back to traditional values of making everything out of scratch and, and how to enjoy it and celebrate it and appreciate it. And you become very mindful of the process from point A, where you're pitting the cherries to making it into jam and then turning it into something else. And so recently, I'm taking a very traditional ingredient and adding it onto burgers, adding it onto pizza, adding it into rice dishes. So you're bringing a piece of a tradition in a very creative way, and, and it's just exciting. It's really delicious. <laughs> yeah, that's really cute, actually, because it is, it is kind of, there's a story behind the meal. It's not just, oh, here's a pizza or whatever, so that's, that's kind of cute. What's the jam called? It's olbalu, okay. olbalu, which is sour cherry. And, and what it is is, I also believe that food has energy. I always love cooking for people who I love, because, you know, I've got my neighbors in the crowd, um, and I love cooking for them because they're always so happy to enjoy the meal. And when I know that my, my guests are going to enjoy it, my energy is very different than when I'm obliged to make something. <laughs> and then that translates into, I think, the mental well-being, the, the overall happy Happy vibe, happy gene, or whatever. So your love language is food, basically. Yeah. Cooking, cooking for people. Absolutely. Showing that's Absolutely. so good. Acts of service. That's, that's <laughs> very, very nice. Now, obviously, the, the session is called, you know, Creative Liberties and, and uh, cooking, cooking the Classics, Creative Liberties. So I'm going to turn this now into a pro tip seg segment because, I mean, I'd like our lovely audience to take away at least one thing that's new. Um, so, Dr. Ruby, first coming to you, when cooking, what ingredient swaps do you swear by? And, um, you know, dairy to non-dairy, sugar to stevia, what, what do you swear by? Um, so, it's a really interesting question in terms of swaps. I try and keep some elements of the dish. So, let's say I'm making uh, a Thai salad uh, and the dressing calls for a load of palm sugar 
and sesame oil and, and all the rest of it. I will still have some sugar in that dressing because it does need balance. And even if you were to try and uh, replace that sugar with uh, a, a plant uh, alternative like stevia or monk fruit or something like that, there's something missing. It does need something. So instead of really looking at swaps to the actual ingredient, I just try and reduce the amount because healthy eating really comes down to dose and quality. And dose, well, I mean like quantity, the amount of sugar that you're putting in. So instead of putting two tablespoons in, I'd probably put like a teaspoon and try and um, try and mimic that with the bitter notes and the sour no and the um, uh, chili notes as well in that dressing. So I, I always try and like still have the, the bones of the recipe in something rather than just trying to swap with the ingredients because I've tried that and it just completely doesn't work. And there's a reason why these recipes have stood the test of time is because they work and, and you, you want to be respectful of that. And then also, I think you can take inspiration from different uh, recipes like um, I mentioned already, like a dal, dal makhani, which has got those beautiful tarka spices, you've got the, um, uh, the butter and the creaminess. There are ways in which you can still have those flavors, but it doesn't need to be as rich. So with the dal makhani, what I do is I don't actually add any cream, but what I do is I mash some of the beans in the stew, and that gives a creamy element to it instead of adding lots of cream. So when you have my one, instead of having to sit down for a couple of hours, you'll still be able to function a couple of hours afterwards <laughs> rather than, you know, with, with all the dairy and cream that you've, you've ingested. And I think also there is a time for indulgence and luxury. Um, I, I really do believe that food should be enjoyed and we should be, you know, it's one of the, 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 the best and easiest routes to pleasure. We're hardwired to love food. And so to take that away completely, I think, is the wrong approach within reason. Um, so I will still indulge like every once every couple of weeks and I'll have like my favorite uh, recipes. So, you know, I, I think having that perspective is, is really important too. Yeah. That's, well, that's two new things I, I genuinely have learned. I mean, I've never thought of doing the half-half approach. Yeah. And I have baked with stevia before, and it was disastrous. It doesn't work. Yeah. So I might try <laughs> your tip here. Um, Zahra, do you, do you cheat at all? Do you, do, you, do you put in any alternatives that go undetectable? I, I, I always try... I'm never going to say I'm a healthy cook. I, I always say I'm a wholesome. I like using real ingredients whole ingredients. Um, but every so often, my husband will come with a new trend that he wants me to create a menu for him. So we've gone vegan, we've gone carbs-free. And so what's really nice is that it's allowed me to research more about our regional ingredients, and we have so many healthy ingredients that can be used as alternatives. So frika, for example, it's a, it's a very healthy, wholesome, um, you know, superfood. And it's a great alternative to rice. Um, you can add it to your soups, you can add it to your salads, you can add it as, as a rice alternative. And I think if you have the willingness to be creative, there's so much opportunity to be so. And, um, and in our region, there's so many ingredients. And, I, and actually, I'm, this is what I love about traveling and living in so many countries, is that you have access to so many alternative ingredients that you wouldn't have thought about using. Mm -hmm. You know, buckwheat, which is, uh, uh, you know, a typical uh, East, Eastern European ingredient. Um, you've got the quinoa from, you know, Latin America. You've got a burgul. And these are all really delicious, wholesome, hearty, filling alternatives to maybe like just plain white rice. Um, and I, I do love my white rice. <laughs> but it's, you can be creative, just be a bit open-minded to the approach. Yeah, and, and even though you don't refer to your cooking as healthy, the fact these swaps, I mean, if you, if you look at somebody with diabetes or an insulin-related uh, condition like PCOS, for example, the, 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 the insulin response to white rice versus something healthier yeah. is, is phenomenal and it, it does make a difference to, to people's diets. Yeah. So it's definitely something to look into and if anyone has any insulin issues or whatever, I encourage you to kind of look into uh, the different insulin. It's actually insulin interesting. Um, so my brother-in-law is into the healthcare field and 
deals a lot with diabetes. And so at one point, they put a CGM on my arm just to track my, my, my blood sugar spikes with different food. And so my sister would have one, and we would observe as a family how that same ingredient would react so differently to all three of us. So it's really interesting that, you know, you can't say that this is the, the, a blanket statement, that this is healthy compared to someone else. It's just healthy for you versus some, another ingredient. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really agree with that. I think the future of personalized medicine is going to be personalized nutritional medicine as well. And so the, the, the opportunity of having a continuous glucose monitor that you put on so you can actually see what your reaction is to white rice or the combination of white rice, beans, and greens and actually mit, like, uh, watch uh, what your responses are and actually change your behaviors based on that, I think is going to be game-changing. Um, and I mean, I, I wear a, a ring and that tracks my sleep and that's been really okay. good for my sort of uh, behavior change as well. So it kind of gives me some insights as to when is best to eat, work out, and when I need to relax a bit mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So actually, referring to that, is it true that when you eat has an effect? Because you have people say, well, don't eat after six. Yeah. Others are like, uh, calories are calories, yeah. do whatever. What's your take on that? Yeah, so I... I take a, an evolutionary perspective to a lot of these things so like a back to basics approach instead of going for refined uh, grains trying uh, go for diversity in all the different um, grains that we have access to so all those different whole grains is, is great um, and also taking that evolutionary perspective we, we're not designed to have access to food 24 hours a day and eating outside those windows. So there's some really interesting research coming out of West uh, America looking at time-restricted feeding, which is different to intermittent fasting. Time-restricted feeding is just changing when you eat, not the calorie content or the macro content of your food. And what they've shown is that eating in a 10 to 12-hour window has been uh, pretty game-changing for your insulin response it gives your gut a chance to rest as well. Uh, and it means that your responses to food are gonna be a lot more controlled. Um, also, probably, uh, looking at it from a practical sense, it probably means that you're not gonna overeat as much. So you're not gonna be eating ice cream in front of the TV at like 11 p.m. and then disrupting your sleep. So I think as a, as a guide, not like something that you have to live rigidly by, an eating window of 10 to 12 hours, so practically starting at, say, 7 a.m. and then finishing up your meal by 6 or 7 p.m. the next day, uh, the, the following evening, that, uh, that's a, a generally good approach. And sometimes that's the first thing I, I tell people to do. I don't care what you're eating, just eat within this window and see how you feel after two weeks. And it, and it can be very, very motivating. Yeah. And it's interesting how these practices kind of come from a very, very, very long time ago, because if yeah. you look at Ramadan, for example, where you're fasting for 30 days, it's, it's a common misconception, I believe, that it, fasting makes you gain weight. I think fasting just makes you gain weight if you're going to a buffet iftar every day kind of thing. But they've actually, studies have shown that that type of fasting as well does have, it's the time restrictive. So it's, it's fascinating how all of these, you know, especially the principles you've mentioned as well, are from a really long time ago, but mm. we're starting to kind of bring them back to the forefront and, and, and think about them again. Yeah, if you th I mean, if you think about lots of different cultures, they all have fasting mm -hmm. in their practice. And I think w we've known from a, for a long time, our ancestors have tapped into the potential for fasting. It's we're talking about fasting when we're, uh, we're, <laughs> we're both cookbook writers, isn't it? <laughs> Fast, but then eat. When but you're... then eat, yeah, eat well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Zara, uh, Zara, sorry, um, uh, what tips do you have for avoiding processed? Because you like the wholesome. So I, you're a mom, yeah. three kids, it's a lot of work, in addition to you know, writing a book and running a business and, and all that. So how do you avoid going, oh, I'm just gonna open this and... So for me, um, being a mom, it's really important to support other moms and remind them to, first of all, be kind to themselves. There is this pressure to be this perfect human being, get everything right, do everything from scratch, and it can be so overwhelming and, 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 and too much for someone to handle. Um, there are certain principles that, that I took from my grandmother, and that's going, being seasonal. And so there are certain ingredients that we'll get, and I know that we'll make some nice dishes out of it. So just prepare it, chop it, 
fry it, saute it, and just freeze it. So you might sit and spend an hour extra preparing a larger quantity of it and then just put it into the freezer so that when you, want, you do want to cook out of scratch, you can do it quickly. Um, that being said, I do cheat once in a while and I'll buy my chopped vegetables from the supermarket, I'll buy my jarred pesto. Um, for me, I think being healthy, eating healthy, isn't necessarily only about the food you eat, but the energy that you have and the mental well-being, the space that you're in, so that you have a healthy experience. Because you could eat super healthy, but still be sick. Yeah. So why not find that balance and, and just do it? Um, so while I think Dr. Rupi is more about the tangible approach to healthy eating, I'm on a, I guess, unintentional, but... Um, I guess, intentional uh, view of the intangible way of healthy living. Yeah. Um, because we need connection and we need, uh, we need to feel like we're part of a community, whether it's sitting at home with our family and eating a meal, having your neighbors over, or just going out and enjoying um, a meal uh, with friends. Yeah. The act of breaking bread with somebody has so many layers of, of health benefits um, that's not recognized or, 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 or celebrated enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and cooking every day can actually be quite stressful, which is, it, you know, that, that will kind of be undoing the whole Which the is why I, li I love the three, two, one idea. I think it's great. <laughs> exactly, this is, this is, it. This is <laughs> I, it. I am going to have to change some of my approach to cooking, three, two, one. <laughs> Susara has her new uh, book, yeah, uh, next, yeah, next book idea now. Maybe collaboration <laughs> in the works, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 again, the common thing, balance, balance is, is important. And, okay, I'm going to ask something now, and you don't have to mention names, but, <laughs> look, there's a lot of nutritional nonsense online, especially from, like, the wellness industry, <laughs> where nobody's really qualified. But uh, what's, what's the worst advice that you've ever heard via the industry, and the you would... Tell our lovely audience to avoid like, <laughs> yeah. the plate. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's really easy for me now to sit here with my, you know, master's in nutrition and 10 years of clinical experience and just rag on people who are perhaps lesser, well, or lesser read on the subject. No. You studied, you studied. No, that was three yeah. years of no, the no, master's, no. so it's fine. <laughs> but I, I, I actually honestly think the worst advice has actually come from my own sort of profession, medics in general, uh, disassociating the impact of food and other lifestyle measures and the importance next to the other very important things that we have, pharmaceuticals, interventions, talking therapies, etc. The, the magnitude, the impact that nutrition can have is in sometimes more effective than preventative medicine that, we, that I prescribe. And so I think the biggest misconception and the, the biggest issues have actually come from the medical community not recognizing nutrition as a clinical tool that we should do. Um, it's very easy for me to say, you know, that this person said this food and, you know, celery and all that kind of stuff. And there's loads of nonsense celery. out there. It's very, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 there's, it, you don't have to look very far. But I think if we can educate uh, doctors in nutrition and we can educate the public through schooling as well and getting kids involved in, in cooking from a really young age, things that Zara was talking about by you know, getting her kids involved in the kitchen, that's how we dig ourselves out of this hole of misinformation because social media is only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So we have to the, put those foundations in very, very early and we have to get more people thinking about nutrition as a, as a medicinal tool. Um, I think also uh, playing on what Zara was saying about the mindset in which you eat, very, very important. And one of the attributes of the Mediterranean diet that perhaps doesn't get talked about as much is the uh, impact of communal eating. The, the, the sitting around a table, the speed at which we eat, the stress condition that we eat in as well. A lot of us, myself included, eat in front of a screen or we're, we're rushing because we're at work and actually having time to sit down and enjoy every element of your meal is something that can have a, a tangible impact on your physiology. Yeah. And it's been demonstrated in some really interesting research studies as well that we can talk about later. I just wanted to add something yeah. that you pointed out, which is really important. I think we're inundated with so many you should, you should, you should. Mm. 
um, and you don't have enough, let me, sh so there is something to be said of just showing. So, you know, you're showing, but not saying you must do it. And, and, and you're showing because you're living it, you're experiencing it, you're doing it. Um, and I think we need more of that. We need less people who are just telling you, this is what you must do, because there's just too many. So you must, you should, or, or, or you can do what suits you, and I'm doing what I think suits me, and then you find ways to develop it so that it's, it tailors more to, to your own needs. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I remember seeing some vegan, you know, social media stars who were then caught eating meat behind the scenes, and they were just doing it because veganism was popular, but it was for the money, it wasn't really for, you're not really living it. Um, have you heard anything? I mean, you get a lot of comments. <laughs> Do you, do you get anyone going, oh, well, this is not healthy, or like, you should I get, be doing I get, this and that? I get a lot of, you, 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 you use a lot of meat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm Sudanese. <laughs> we don't eat vegetables. <laughs> and Iranian. <laughs> and Iranian, we love our vegetables. So it's finding this balance. Um, I make thing, food that makes me feel good. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to say, and I, and I get comments, oh, but you're emotionally eating. No, it's not, it's not, I'm not associating the food as my, my, my source of dealing with stress. I, it's my space of, 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 of nourishment. It's, it's my space of like filling my bucket. So yeah. it's really about how you view, and you know, Food, you know, transcends so many different barriers, so many different conversations. Here we're having a conversation about health, but you're, you can take food and understand how it has such a positive impact. Like, we had a, a session with autistic children, and that tactile movement of maybe making gnocchi just calmed them down because it just, it was a bit meditative. They, they zoned in to just a simple movement of just shaping uh, a little gnocchi or shaping a little dobo. So food, the act of going into the kitchen isn't this traditional view. And I feel like in this region, I've had many people approach me and say, oh, it's a gender, gender uh, bias space, for example. It's only a place for women and not for a man. And I have girlfriends and, and, and people who message me. They're like, thank you for changing my view about cooking. Thank you for letting me appreciate the joy of cooking. Thank you for letting me know that I'm nourishing myself, but also my family. And, and it's just changing perspective, bringing your family into the kitchen because you're creating a bond. You know, I had a friend say, you know, whenever the, this song goes on, everyone knows that the husband's in the kitchen cooking and everyone's doing the little jiggy dance. And, and when the kids have moved out, whenever they hear that song, it reminds them of this beautiful nostalgic memory of them, their father in the kitchen. And they're all like cooking together and the mom's washing because she hates cooking. And, but they, they have their little community. So... That's so lovely. Yeah. I, you know what? I see a collaboration happening here because you know you you got the the cooking thing down. You you got the act of you know encouraging people to get together and yeah, just 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 do it, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to ask actually in terms of the education uh, educational side, uh, calories in, calories out. Now I I once met someone who was meant to be in an advisory role who. who just annoys me to this day, who was like, oh, well, if you eat 200 calories of bro broccoli uh, or 200 calories of brownies, it's the same thing. And I was like, <laughs> very, very different. Um, but a lot of people still preach that whole calories in, calories out. If, you know, the more, if it's less calories in than calories out, then you'll lose weight. But obviously that's not really the case. What do you, uh, what do you advise? Do you, how do you balance it? Is, do you look at macros, for example? How do you approach it? So... Um, yeah, it's a really antiquated uh, view of how people put on weight and lose weight. And I think time and time again, especially recently, I think we're coming around to this idea that it's not quite as simple as that. And it's based on research that is over 100 years old. Um, calories do exist. No one can deny that. You know, food does have energy and that we consume that in various forms. But how we partition that fuel is very different from person to person. Your genetics has an impact, your mindset has an impact, uh, your microbiota, so the population of microbes that live in and around your body, larger in your gut, has an impact. Um, 
you, there was some really interesting research that came out of Stanford uh, about 10 years ago now, and it was called Mind Over Milkshakes. You can look it up. It's a fascinating study. They labeled a milkshake, um, which was super indulgent. It had like loads of fats in it. It was like six or 700 calories. And they gave it to uh, a, a number of people, measured their hormone responses to that, so something called ghrelin. Um, before and afters, and obviously they, they felt like super full after that. And then two weeks later, they gave them a different milkshake. It was low fat, it was like, uh, had all these fillers in and stuff, and all the sugar removed for replacements, and it was much lower in calories, and then they measured their responses afterwards. What they found with the high fat one is that their ghrelin responses was indicative of something that was quite calorific, and the inverse with the low calorie one. But what the, the participants didn't realize is that the milkshakes were identical, absolutely identical, but their hormone responses, nothing that they can control themselves, was very different. So it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Mindset is really important when it comes to how we partition food and, and actually what physiological effect it can have. And so calories, going back to the calories thing, um, it's, it's a lot more nuanced than the food industry would like you to believe. And for a lot of companies, it's a very convenient truth to have uh, calories uh, in, calories out, because it means that that fizzy drink that's full of sugar isn't more harmful than anything else that has the same calorie content, unfortunately. But we know there are eight physiological uh, drivers behind obesity, um, and so this really needs to be talked about quite a bit more. Um, I've done probably about four podcasts on this with different obesity researchers from across the world as well. We have a, a bit more of a nuanced discussion. But I think the general takeaway is that food really comes down to the quality of its ingredients, the way in which you consume food, and trying to get diversity in because that will improve the function of your microbiota rather than an arbitrary calorie number, which in a lot of cases is, is quite incorrect. Yeah. And I swear the mind makes such a difference. I swear sometimes if I'm stressing over what I'm eating and it's the same kind of calories, I gain weight. But then when I'm not bothered about it and I don't think about it and I go, well, nah, I'm just going to do what I want, don't gain weight. So it's, it's even, I swear there's, there's a connection there. Do you, do you think about calories at all or macros or anything? You just do what makes you feel comfortable. I just cook. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I just go to the supermarket. Ooh, nice tomatoes. Let's go make something. And I love... I, I love going to a supermarket that's that's pretty. <laughs> Do you go when hungry though? Because that's disastrous. No, I'll go have my coffee yeah. and then I'll go in. <laughs> um, during the pandemic, um, my husband, who who never works from home, worked from home for two years, and we built this really nice tradition where we go and have drop the kids off to school, go and have a coffee, and then go to the local supermarket, and then we'd walk around and decide the menu for the day, um, and. It's just nice, it's, it allows you to be creative because sometimes you just get bored of you know, making the same thing. And actually some of my most creative creations were just by random visits to the supermarket and seeing something and like, hmm, let's see what we can make today. Yeah. So it's fun. Yeah, this is why I have your book because I can't do that. I don't have a talent for that. I'll go to the supermarket and go, I don't know, I have no idea what's to put together. So this, is, uh, this has been really, really helpful. Um, and obviously the one pound thing as well because <laughs> I, yeah, I need that. Um, what have, like, okay, so not macros. Do you have any healthy cooking methods? I mean, do you, are there any methods that you prefer over others? So I used to be a heavy fryer and I'm learning to say no to frying, although <laughs> frying is always so much better. It's so good. <laughs> I love frying, so I've discovered an air fryer, because I used to roast um, certain dishes, and it just didn't crisp up the way I like it, but the air fryer is amazing, so yeah. it satisfies that crunch that I want, because, you know, it, texture is important, um, and, you know, and I, I'd rather have a couple of bites of a really good indulgent dish than you know, a plateful uh, of not very good yeah, <laughs> indulgence. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and one of the tips, you know, a lot of people, especially those who are um, watching their weight or they have to manage their weight due to a condition, they do this thing as well at restaurants where when their meal first arrives, they split it in half yeah. and, and have the rest to go. Because obviously we don't like food waste, yeah. but then it encourages them, yeah, that approach of I'd rather have two bites of something yeah. that they're not kind of attack the whole meal. I think I also want to point out that we forget eating real food, whole food is a luxury. 
um, it's not accessible to everybody. Yeah. The reason why there's all this processed food is because it's making it accessible economically to a population that doesn't have that extra resources or finances to be able to get real food. So that the fact that we can go to the supermarket today and buy a real apple and buy a real tomato, and whether it's organic or not, for me anyways, is still a luxury. Um, you know, I remember uh, I did this stint in Baltimore and uh, just outside the John Hopkins area. It's a very actually economically poor community and you'd go into the supermarket and it's all processed food and it's really heartbreaking because you're, you're in a very developed country but even that even a very developed country they don't have the, the privilege or the access to buy real food um, so takes me to this belief that it's really important to be mindful of our food and respectful of it so even if you buy something and it's going to go bad just don't waste it because that's still a luxury so make it, you know take your tomatoes that are going to go rotten and make it into tomato sauce or saute it and just have it ready for a spaghetti later on um, try to avoid wasting it just because it's really a luxury. Yeah, no, 100%. And, and, and Dr. Rupi, I mean, you mentioned the key word earlier, industry, food industry, you know, and, and you know, the UK has the same problem as well with sugar-laden foods being the, the, the cheapest. And, and I remember all these years ago, I mean, when I was still a student, I think Jamie Oliver started with the school dinners and how, well, nutrition starts from when you're young, you know, it's outrageous that we don't have that. Yeah. Um, apart from promoting it through your work. I mean, is the look, I mean, the UK government right now, is there anything we can do to actually beat the food industry, so to speak? I, I think, um, so we, we vote with uh, our pounds uh, or, or dirham or, or whatever your, your currency is. Um, and so choosing whole foods as much as possible is, is really, you know, painting the picture of what we want to see. And, you know, for everything that the wellness industry has done wrong over the last few years, what they've done right is actually increase the diversity of what we have access to. All those different grains that people never heard of, now you can find them in small supermarket stores that you find dotted around the country in the UK. Um, they've popularized things like green vegetables, you know, everyone's talking about how they get the greens in and stuff. So there are certain things that I, I can see over a, such a, a short period of time of just 10 years about how that's actually changing our food landscape. Also, what you're seeing is more reformulations with the food industry, so you definitely need to work with them. But I think we are fighting a battle where, like Zara was saying, you have food that's been uh, made to be palatable, uh, to hit that bliss point, they've spent millions of dollars in research just trying to get those taste balances right and to be super scalable so we can feed as many people as possible. And that was really at the direction of the government as well. It was, you know, we need to feed all these people. We need to find out ways in which to preserve, to produce, uh, and to, to scale and, and, uh, and send it out. So that, that's something that I think we need to certainly battle with. When it comes to principles, like I'm pretty dietary agnostic, I'm not vegan or vegetarian or not paleo, whatever, that yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, really agnostic when it comes to someone's dietary principles because it's not for me to, to judge how someone should be eating or not, but I do tend to, people, uh, tend to uh, describe principles of eating to people, so trying to eat whole as much as possible rather than process on that spectrum, we all, we all eat somewhere on that spectrum, but we're just trying to move people towards more whole food eating. Lots of diversity, colors, uh, fiber, something that's really lacking our diet. And with the more research that we learn about the microbiota, this, this population of bugs, we know it's completely inseparable from health. It regulates sugar, balances inflammation. It's very important for weight control. It has a, a, a direct impact on our mental well-being, something that's a very hot topic globally and for good reason. Um, and largely plants. So if you still want to eat meat, that's absolutely fine, but make sure the majority of what you're eating is plant-focused, because we know that a plant-focused diet definitely hits all those different principles, and that's really distilled from looking at all the population studies, all the metabolic studies, all the mechanistic studies behind how food interacts with our physiology. Um, 
so those are the things that I tend to, to sway people towards rather than strict macros or strict sort of uh, diets that people have to follow. Yeah. Do you hear that, Zara? Less, less, less meat. I know, I know. I know that that <laughs> you can still have meat. But like <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just wanted to, uh, before, I, I'm going to come see Dr. Ruby about your, your favorite cooking methods. But in the meantime, um, there are two mics in the back. So who had a question if there are any other tips that you'd like to know. Hello. Um, good morning, and thank you so much. I'm just loving the conversation. So I'm a, health, uh, a sleep consultant here in Dubai, and we talk about the three pillars of health, nutrition, sleep, and exercise. And of course, you couldn't do exercise or nutrition without our sleep. One of my biggest problems here, and I think it is most places, about families being frightened about food, and also about children, they're hungry, that's why they're waking up at night. So how do we reach families with you know, young children and really educate them about the importance of food? How do we reach them? Because I see this on a daily basis about families. It's not just not having the time, but really not understanding the value of food. Yeah. So from both of you, it's a, for me, it's how do we reach our families for the future? That's a great Thank question. You. That is, yeah. Do you want to go? Uh, I'll go first. Yeah, you're the one with the family, with three kids. So <laughs> yeah, you I don't have, have you any have kids. A puppy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's a really important uh, topic um, and something that I think stems at multiple levels. So, at school, uh, at medical school, and within the uh, the medical community itself as well. So, what I've started doing in the UK at least is um, we started a non-profit called Culinary Medicine which is where we teach medical students not just about the foundation of nutrition, but also how to cook. And we get that conversation happening with three different parties, the medical students themselves and the culinary students, professional chefs, so we get them in a kitchen environment, and we have a registered dietitian as well. So that three-way conversation, that, that experience that they have of cooking a spaghetti uh, and making it slightly healthier and actually talking to them about behavior change, that's how we're, we're trying to focus to, to get the, the topic of nutrition it inbuilt into, into clinical consults. And I think the other thing is, is really looking at um, uh, the educational program for kids as well. So kids are, are amazing educators for their pa parents. You know, they'll go home, they'll have a leaflet, they'll say, oh, we did this in class, or can we make this? You know, they're amazing ambassadors for nutrition. And I think that's probably like an easier way in rather than trying to go from the parents themselves. So uh, th there's a few ideas, and I think there, there's some really interesting examples of what's happening in the UK and America. Um, but on a practical level, I, I think Zara is probably more, <laughs> more uh, better suited to, to answer. I, 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 co I commonly hear my child's a picky eater. What can I do to help them eat better? And, you know, over the years, uh, I've had the opportunity to interact in different circumstances outside my nuclear family set up with families who have little children and who are struggling. And one thing that I've learned, it's not an absolute statement, but it's a, it's a general uh, repetitive um, observation, is that families aren't eating together. Um, the children are having their meal times by themselves, um, either in front of an iPad. Um, we're social beings. We need to eat together. Um, and, and I say, if you can't, as a parent, eat with your child, then make sure that someone's eating with them. Um, because what happens is, you know, this whole monkey see, monkey do, we, we, are, we do what we see. And so I've seen friends visit with their nephew, with their children, I mean, and while my children are eating their meal, their kids will be eating the same thing that my kids are eating. And the mom will be like, Zara, how did my child eat that dish? I'd never have them. They'd never even touch it. First of all, it wasn't forced down their throat. It wasn't said, you must eat this because it's a green. They want to be part of that social experience. They want to feel like they're included. The focus is about conversation, about interaction. The food is secondary. And when it's not forced on you, then it's more enjoyed. And I also noticed that most of the parent, children who, have, who are picky eaters, chances are their parents are picky eaters themselves and their children are observing the same habits of the parents. Um, and so if there's one wish I would say is 
is take the time, and I know for some families it's very difficult, if not daily, make a habit of it weekly, once or twice a week. Um, I'm not a boards game person. I love creating bonds with my children, but I, I'm terrible at sitting at Monopoly. Um, so I have to find my way of creating my bond with my children. And so we have a habit where once a week, we'll go and find a nice new restaurant. And it's amazing because they'll have the seaweed salad, they'll have the tuna tartare, they'll have the flavors, the, the textures that are very different and unique and they're open to it. Because for them, they're part of that experience of we're doing this as a family. So I feel that's what I hope would help with, with maybe developing the palate. Um, I mean, that, that was a great question, and it's the fact that sometimes, yeah, parents, like you said, parents are so disconnected, but it's just, I mean, tell them, look, your, your children will not act up if you actually engage with them, so maybe that will force them into, you know, actually realizing that that's a good thing. Education. There's another conversation that I've been reading a lot about, is self-worth. A lot of people don't have it, and, um, and, and, I mean, I was just reading Will Smith's book, and he had an issue with self-worth. So it's really amazing. You see this superstar, and he has a question of self-worth. And it's one of the most important values to have to just be successful in general. To, and, and I think that it's simple things it's the, that, more, that count more than the bigger things. So that's, I'm worthy to sit and enjoy a meal with you is really important. Um, and, and if you... Find ways, if you're conscious, you're mindful, aware of how you can create those little you know, connections, it's really impressive to see how much more positive you can have an impactful life. Amazing. You guys have come with some fantastic advice. <laughs> um, right, so before we sign off, I'm going to ask you one final question. Um, if you could encourage our lovely audience to make one change to their eating habits, tomorrow, what would it be? I'm going to go first. I would say pick up Cooking with Zara for some great <laughs> recipes, and also uh, pick up 321, uh, Dr. Ruby's favorite book right now. Those are my tips. But what are your tips in terms of um, just one change to eating habits tomorrow? I need them as well. What do I need to do? What would our audience, what can they try? Um, one thing I was recently told, and I'm trying to embody in my day-to-day -day life is when I see that chocolate cake, have it, enjoy it, and don't think about it going to the hips. Don't already associate a negative thought to it. Enjoy it, it and appreciate the beautiful flavors, appreciate the effort that was made into it, and just say, thank you, I had, that was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's very popular. Definitely. Thanks, so basically I have permission now to eat chocolate cake every day. <laughs> awesome, great. <laughs> End of session. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, the psychology of it is, it, honestly, it is tr there is a connection there, yeah. not thinking about it and whatnot, and being on holiday. And I know, obviously, you're on kind of on holiday right now, so you're getting to enjoy Dubai's culinary scene, yeah. and, and I know you, you balance it quite well. Um, but, okay, let's say, you, you know, you've come off some travel to Dubai where there's a lot of great food. What do you do when you go back? How do you... Um, so calibrate. I, I'm anchored by my routine. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. So my routine is um, pretty fastidious when I'm at home. But if I if I miss something, I don't beat myself up about it. I try not to post two days in, in a row where I where I'm off my routine. Um, and it usually starts with meditation in the morning to set myself up for the whole day. And it can be as short as five minutes or as long as 15. Um, I exercise first thing in the morning because, the, I mean, there's evidence that shows that, yeah, it, it will um, set you up in terms of your body clock, it improves your sleep, um, getting some of that morning light first thing in the morning is, is fantastic for setting your circadian rhythm, but also it just makes me feel so much better as well. There's an endorphin rush in the morning and it just sets me up for my day. And I'll continue some of those things that I do with my routine, even when I'm traveling as well. And so that you know, allows me the space to enjoy the culinary scene out here and try all these beautiful <laughs> restaurants and getting some more tips from Zara about which restaurants I need to, <laughs> exactly. to go to this weekend. You have um, the best advisor. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, it's amazing. And the, the scene here is incredible uh, as well. It's just so diverse. In terms of like the, the tips that I, I think would give people the most bang for your buck, 
Um, I did a TED talk a couple of years ago and the, the final message was just one more. And the concept is, can you add just one more fruit, vegetable, nut or seed per day or even per meal time? Per meal time, fantastic. Because the benefits of food are not in you know, a, a particular healthy ingredient or a week of healthy eating. It's really the cumulative co uh, components of food over time. And so if you can create a habit of having these beautiful, wonderful foods in every day, that's what has the tangible long-term benefit, not the inclusion of it in a singular format, in a, in a one-off healthy meal. So just think to yourself, just one more, can I have just one more fruit, vegetable, nut or seed per day? And that can have uh, cumulative impacts over time. Awesome. And chocolate is a fruit, so... Um, <laughs> Dark that. chocolate is actually very healthy. It's full of flavanols. It's been shown to lower blood pressure and improve your happy hormones. But, but dark chocolate, no, <laughs> not. Dark chocolate. <laughs> not the chocolate king every day. Um, great. Well, this I mean, fabulous, fabulous tips. Thank you um, so much for, for the tips. I've personally learned a lot, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this as well. Um, this brings us to the end of the session. But before you head off, I just wanted to remind you that book signings are happening outside, so in the lobby area, where you can pick up all these lovely titles. Um, and before uh, we do so, I'd just like to thank uh, you guys, your, the audience, for, for being here with us today. Thank you for spending your weekend with us. Um, also the AV team, volunteers and lovely translators, our title sponsor Emirates Airline, our founding partner Dubai Culture, our parent organization Emirates Literature Foundation and our session sponsor Dubai Tourism. And obviously last but not least we have Dr. Rupi Ojula. <laughs> Did I get it right? Ojula. <laughs> <laughs> and Zahra Abdullah, thank you so much thank for being you. here. I've been Rachel MacArthur, thank you for joining us. Thank you.